Hey guys, uh, today I am back with another video to talk about streaming. Um, I apologize in advance because much unlike my chode, uh, this video is going to be pretty freaking long. Um, additionally, the one other really nice thing about this is that the second we're done covering streaming, we've basically covered all like the fundamental slash, you know, theoretical topics. So now from here on out, we can either basically look at specific technologies or like even more in-depth algorithms. So. Um, we're going to start going from, you know, systems design noobs to experts after this video. Um, either way, let's get into it, because like I said, it's going to be a long one. All right, well, stream processing, what is it? Um, as far as the background goes, um, like batch processing, there are often times where we have data and we want to perform some sort of computation on it in the background. However, unlike batch processing, which takes a bounded set of input files, streaming works on an unbounded set of data. So we go ahead and do that um, you know, on messages as they come in, basically, and then we process them asynchronously. Um, messages are going to be created by some node in our system called a producer. That could be a server or a client or anything. And then eventually it's going to be handled, hopefully, by at least one consumer node. Um, and then finally, even though these messages can be sent directly from producer to consumer via protocols like UDP multicast or something like that, generally speaking, we tend to use an intermediary such as a message broker in order to buffer these messages in some sort of centralized place or queue. So let's talk about those message brokers because that's kind of the most important concept of this video. Message brokers are a special type of database for streaming. All they basically do is allow producers and consumers to connect to them. The producers can push messages to them and the consumers can go ahead and automatically pull messages from them. Um, some keep those messages durably, which means that even after they've been sent to a consumer, they still stay in the message broker, and others don't, they just go ahead and delete them. Um, so there are basically two delivery patterns for a message broker. Uh, one is fan out, which means every message that's in the broker is going to be sent to all consumers that are subscribed to the broker. And there's also load balancing, which is basically saying in order to maximize throughput and performance, each one of the consumers is going to only handle one message in order to process as many messages as we can at a time. Okay, what about sending messages in order? Even though the messages are represented by a queue, which inherently should hold those messages in a first in, first out order, if a message takes really long to process, or if um, a consumer fails while handling a message, the message broker generally is not going to wait for an acknowledgement from the consumer that it has properly handled a message and will instead send out the subsequent messages to other consumers. Hence, unless we take additional precautions on our end, which I'll discuss later in the video, generally speaking, we can assume that messages are not going to be delivered or processed in order. Okay, so there are two main types of message brokers and I'll discuss them both now. The first is in memory. So for example, if we have something like a Redis instance, which is basically just a database that um, allows you to write to memory as opposed to disk, um, we can just go ahead and make a queue in there and use our messages and um, you know establish some sort of long polling with a bunch of consumers. Um, and then the second that a consumer acknowledges that it's um, processed a message, that'll be deleted. Um, the other type are log-based message brokers, and I'll discuss those now, but the main point is that the messages are held on disk in some sort of log. So what is a log-based message broker? Well, basically every single message goes to an append-only log on disk, which as we know means the writes are going to be pretty fast because we can just you know do them sequentially. Additionally, that log can actually be partitioned and replicated in order to ensure fault tolerance. Obviously, we don't want to be losing any messages if our message broker server goes down. And in addition, the fact that it's partitioned means that we can have multiple consumers reading from each partition, and that way we can improve parallelism and performance. Um, generally speaking, we do one consumer per partition, and the reason to do this is that ensures that all of the messages are going to be handled in the proper order per partition. So that's important to note, which is that, you know, obviously if we're load balancing our messages between partition via some sort of like consistent hashing method, um, then uh, it, it's not necessarily all going to be in order, but if, you know, we like smartly distribute the messages per partition, uh, we might be able to handle those in an order that we want. Uh, another thing to note is the issue with having one consumer per partition is that one long uh, message that you know it takes a while to process is going to slow all the other messages um, in that partition down from being processed because they have to wait for the slow one. Okay, so actually representing this visually, as you can see, we have these two partitions in a log-based message broker, and as you can see, we have. Um, a consumer reading each of them, and the producer, based on some sort of hash function, can push a message to either of these partitions. So on a write, for example, let's say we're going to go and write to the top partition, 
um, and we'll say write m5, all we're going to really do is use our hash function to decide which partition the message is going to be sent to, and then go ahead and append it to that write-only log. Okay. In terms of reading a message, as you can see, each consumer is keeping track of which index that it is currently read in the log. What does this do? Well, it shows us which um, messages have already been handled. So if that consumer fails, we have the fault tolerance aspect of saying, OK, we're not going to accidentally uh, reprocess this message. So that's really useful. But as you can see, now that uh, consumer 2 is reading M7, it can go ahead and say, OK, now we're on index 2, which means the next message we should be reading is M8. Um, the second that uh, the message broker receives an acknowledgment, by the consumer that it successfully read a message, it's going to increment that index um, locally, thus keeping track of how much the consumers have read. Okay, so what's the ultimate comparison between log-based message brokers versus in-memory message brokers? Well, in-memory message brokers are really good in terms of their performance. Um, messages, if they take a long time to process, obviously you want them to be written to and read from memory because that's just faster writes than disk. But in addition, um, when their order doesn't matter and we just want to achieve maximum throughput because, say, they you know take a while to process, that would, in a log-based message broker, be a real bottleneck because it means that the partition can't move forward until that message is processed. So if you just want to have a bunch of consumers and achieve really fast throughput in some arbitrary ordering of the messages, in-memory is probably the way to go for you. Otherwise, if you want to have some durability of your messages, maybe you want to be able to replay them later or take a look at them for de debugging purposes, um, or even just order them in some sense or another, then log-based is probably the way to go. Okay, so what are some common usages of streams? Because right now I've kind of just defined them as some arbitrary things, but uh, let's give some examples in order to help um, you know, show everyone what they're actually useful for. One way they're hugely important is logging in metrics. When you're logging in an application, we don't really need to use the logs, generally speaking, instantly or the metrics instantly, but it's good to be able to look back on them, do some processing with them in order to make um, you know, metrics for, say, like a certain time window. So logging in metrics, uh, we want to be able to aggregate certain events into time windows, such as logs or you know, maybe like um, the load on our servers or something like that. And this is challenging for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, are we talking about the time that the message was received by the message broker, the time that um, the message was sent by the server? And it's kind of hard because, like I've mentioned in pr uh, previous videos, most server clocks are out of sync. And as a result of that, it's kind of hard to um, get over the discrepancy of which time to actually use. The processing time, so the time that the event actually happened, or the receiving time, which is the time that the message broker actually got that event. Additionally, what if, say, we want to find all the events that happened from um, you know, 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock p.m. today, and then we know that uh, some event that happened from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock p.m. actually only shows up in the message broker at 3 p.m. Are we going to you know, add it to our window in retrospect, or should we just discard it and accept that we have incomplete data? So you know, these are all considerations to make. In terms of how we might actually put events in a fixed time interval, well, I'll talk about three different types of windows. First, they're tumbling windows. So those are going to be non-overlapping intervals of fixed length. So say, um, every single minute starting at the 0th second, um, so like 12.01, uh, 1201 to 1202, 1202 to 1203, 1203 to 1204, and they're non-overlapping and they're all one minute long. So that's pretty easy to do in terms of, you know, you just actually go ahead and aggregate all that data and calculate it together. However, then there's this thing called hopping windows. Hopping windows are similar, but imagine it being like um, 12 o'clock to 1205, 1201 to 1206, 1202 to 1207. So there's overlap, overlap between them. So what you should actually be doing there is calculating the tumbling window for every single minute and then aggregating those to create a five minute hopping window. And then finally, there's also a concept of a sliding window, which doesn't necessarily have a discrete or, or rather, um, you know, one set start point and end point, but it's just a sliding window of a fixed duration, but it could start at literally any time. All we can really do there is use an in-memory buffer of all the events in the sliding window, and then probably have some secondary process or thread that removes um, events as soon as they're outside of that time window and adds them as soon as they're in the time window. 
Okay, now we also have this concept of change data cap capture. So this is a little bit different than uh, logging in metrics, but basically change data capture is taking the write ahead log from any single database. So imagine we have like a single leader replication. So all of our writes are going to one single database. Change data capture is saying take our write ahead log and don't only send it to the other replicas, but go ahead and stream it to other sources of data that we also have to keep up like our caches, our search indexes, our data warehouses. And as a result, we can actually process those write ahead logs and update our other sources of data to make sure that our derived data is up to date. Um, assuming these logs are persistent, they can also be compacted from you know, getting too big, assuming we're using like a log-based message broker, by just only keeping the most recent value of any key. That's kind of similar to something we did with uh, indexes as well in our first video. And then finally, we have event sourcing. Event sourcing at a surface level is really similar to change data capture, but the subtle difference is this. Instead of streaming changes made to a database and kind of all of that stream is represented as like, hey, what key did we change, you know, what row, what we're actually going to be doing is streaming the user events. So a user event might be something like, you know, Jordan clicks a watch button, Jordan is the 40th watcher of some video. So we're not putting it in database terms, but we're putting it in terms of the actual like front end of the application itself. And then what this does is it allows us to derive a ton of different data um, in basically any way we want. We basically just have to write application code that says, here's, here's how you should handle this event for this database. And what it does is it doesn't leave us to having to deal with one schema of data, but rather we can develop many different schemas of data just because we have all of these events and we can derive a ton of different um, views of the data from it. Okay, now let's quickly talk about stream joins. If you watch the batch processing episode, there are batch processing joins, and this all basically comes from the fact that there are associations within the data. So more or less, like with batches, um, we want to be able to do a ton of joins here, and there are three types that I'll talk about. So stream stream joins, stream table joins, and also table table joins. So the first type, stream stream joins, are basically when we're joining two different types of events in a stream. So the example from DDIA is this, and hopefully this will make sense. Imagine um, I'm Google. Every time you type in the search bar, I want to see um, for that search uh, which advertisements you've clicked, and you might click zero or more advertisements. So I can't just say um, every single time there's a click, log the search that it came from, because then that doesn't show me the searches where there were no clicks. So basically all we can really do is have all of our search events in a stream, have all of our click events in a stream, and then you know try and join them based on this concept of a session ID that probably relates to some sort of you know search ID. So what you'll actually do is in each stream, you'll keep an index of all of those searches or clicks for both the search and the click stream. And then you'll cross-reference the other streams index every time a new event comes in to try and find an association between the two. Um, this local index is something that we'll see a lot in both the other um, in both the other types of joins for the stream, and it all comes down to having to involve some sort of state in our own stream so that we can um, go ahead and reduce the number of calls made to a database or another stream. Okay, now we have this concept of stream table joins where instead of joining two streams together, we have one stream and we're probably trying to enrich an event with some data from a database. So we're gonna make a join on, you know, say a few columns of a database. Obviously, it would be very problematic if every single time a stream event came in, we had to make a very expensive network call uh, to a database. So instead, what we do is we keep a local copy of the database in the stream, so we keep some state there, and then every single time that database is updated, we use change data capture to keep the local copy of our database in the stream updated. Then we can actually perform the join without having to do any network calls. Okay, finally, we have table table joins. This is basically saying, um, you know, imagine that we have two tables where um, every single time where there's a change to them, we frequently want to um, go ahead and take the join of them and keep that join in like a, a kind of cached way where, you know, say we have like a tweets and followers table and we want to see for each tweet uh, which followers to send it out to. So every time there's a new tweet, we want to find all the followers for it. So a table table join can be done by basically having two subscribers for the change data capture of each table. 
And when that change data comes in, you go ahead and perform the join on uh, local copies of a stream. Um, I know I probably didn't explain that in the best way, but uh, hopefully it makes sense. OK, and then finally, I know this keeps going, but we're almost done. Uh, fault tolerance. So we want to ensure, and this is pretty important, that each message is processed exactly once. And that means not zero times, not two times, not three times, only once. So in order to, mess, uh, in order to ensure that each message is processed at least once, what can we do? Well, we can occasionally checkpoint the stream state to disk. So this is especially relevant for in-memory streams. Um, so that, you know, if something were to crash, we still have those messages that are durable and they still get processed at least once. Additionally, if we have a bunch of messages in memory, we can run them as micro batches. So that basically means like you run, I don't know, say 10 stream events as a batch job. And if you recall from the batch job video, batch jobs are really easy to restart if uh, they go wrong. And that way we can ensure that every single message is going to be processed at least once. In order to make sure, however, that messages are not processed more than once, we have a couple of options. We could use atomic transactions. So if you remember two-phase commit, um, it basically involves a coordinator node, making sure that um, in this case, it would be that the message broker both sends the message to the consumer, and the consumer also processes it at the same time. So that's what two-phase commit would do here. However, that's really expensive, and it also isn't very fault tolerant because of a coordinator node. So what a lot of people prefer to use instead is this concept of idempotence, which means that um, you know we only allow an operation that occurs to have an effect one time. So you know if it happens more than once, there will be no additional effect. And a way that this can be done for you know a lot of streaming applications is you use some sort of idempotency key, which is basically just a unique user ID. And then you have some sort of uh, database or system that checks if the user ID has been seen before. And if it has, you don't process the message again. And if it hasn't, you can go ahead and process it. Whew. OK, in conclusion, uh, streaming is becoming pretty important because companies have tons of data that they need to process in the background. And oftentimes, it's not necessarily like a batch job where it makes sense to process it for a discrete time interval. But rather, it's just better if you process it as it comes in. Um, Log-based streams versus uh, in-memory-based streams have their advantages and disadvantages, where the log-based streams um, you know, optimize for durability and ordering, while the in-memory streams just optimize for throughput, basically, and try and uh, get all of those messages out of the memory. Oftentimes, there is a need to do some sort of joining or enriching of stream data. And as you can see, we've covered three methods of stream joins, and that's how you would go ahead and do that. And then finally, um, event sourcing and change data ca capture offer interesting ways to kind of keep up your derived data, whether that's with a search index or a cache or some other data type. Um, OK, overall, yeah, guys, last video of just like the pretty basic concepts to cover. From here on out, we're going to be going pretty in depth. And uh, personally, I greatly look forward to that. So. Uh, I'll